Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. And this week on the show, we have Greta Boris. Yes. And it was a super fun interview. Greta's a podcaster. Uh, she and Megan Haskell have the Author Wheel podcast. And we talk about her transitioning from traditional to indie, mm-hmm. um, her podcast, their nonfiction stuff. It was really, really good. Yeah. yeah. And she had lots of great ideas tips and ideas on Mm -hmm. like how to like really simple, smart things you can do if you want to transition. And then she talked about the really the good parts of being traditionally published. So, Mm -hmm. and how it helped her. So it's really good. Yeah, it was good. So what's been going on with you this week? Well, I did, I sent out all the hardcover books for the Kickstarter. Yes. (laughs) And so my dining room looked like, I don't know, I guess, I suppose with the back room of a publisher looks like. I mean, I have yeah. books everywhere, stickers, tissue paper, tape. I mean, just. Ugh. Did your it's, husband help you? He did. I was yeah. like, how do you feel like about, about uh, helping me package yeah. and seal up 147 envelopes? And he was like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> we'll get out of here faster. So, yeah. yeah. yeah so, that's but great. we did that. And um, it, so that's pretty much done. I, I only have one person who didn't reply with their mailing address. So I still have, you know, yeah. I, I can't send anything until I know where to send it. Mm-hmm. Other right. than that. Right. So yeah, it was great. And um, I actually bought a label printer. I oh. didn't know these existed until recently. It's a small printer that you can just print mailing labels on. And they're mm-hmm. thermal printers. They use heat. Oh. Not heat. So, and it was super fast. And that's I used great. um pirate ship. If, if anyone's doing a lot of shipping mm-hmm. pirate ship, you can get really good rates. So oh, I was yeah. wondering um, how I was going to ask that, how you shipped them. So yeah. that's good to know. Yeah. That's Cause you can know. just take a, you export a CSV file and then you mm-hmm. upload it to um, pirate ship. And then mm-hmm. they give you a list. They can say, do you want to send it us mail, UPS, whatever. And you pick whichever one you want. And mm-hmm. then it just creates the labels for you and you print them. It was, that was like the easiest part. Wow. So, that's yeah. great. That's yeah. awesome. So that's so, me. That's all I've been doing lately. Okay. Well, that's, that's good. That's good. What about you? I am. Um, well, I'm at my daughter's house in Dallas right now. I drove up today and recorded the podcast. And, mm-hmm. you know, last week we had babies. We had technical issues last week. Doorbells we and dogs okay. today we had about the same I, y'all I don't know what I was just saying in the episode I don't know why y'all <laughs> hang with me because I am so unprofessional sometimes um but I'm here this to, is real life though yeah, this is real life y'all <laughs> uh but my this daughter with the five kids they had their Christmas party their my son-in-law's Christmas party tonight and so I told her I'd come help and then uh we're going to a Christmas dinner, she and my mom and I on mm-hmm. Sunday, and then I'm going to stay at my mom's next week. And then next Friday night, uh, the small town that I grew up in, their basketball um, season starts, the mm-hmm. girls' basketball season starts, and they're dedicating the season to my sister. And oh, yeah. uh, my sister's team was the first team to go to state Ooh. in basketball. And uh, so their all their jerseys are going to say play like 12 it's really sweet mm, yeah and you know very small town and mm-hmm. uh so i'm i'm doing that with you know them but um if anybody saw my post this week you know sunday was a bad day for me uh but then monday was better i went to see a therapist for the first time <laughs> well that therapist for the first time and um felt better. I felt better. You know, we, it was mostly just the get to know you kind of thing, but I did feel better when I left and I've been pretty good this week and uh, went to lunch with a friend and we talked writing and we talked books and we talked some <laughs> ideas. And so that was kind nice. of fun. And I actually didn't panic when we were talking about it. So <laughs> I just consider that a win. So, yeah. 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 And uh, mostly just 
decorate my house for Christmas. And yeah, you know, um, I I have set the bar kind of high for my kids and grandkids. So now I really feel for Christmas awesome. celebrations. Yeah, for, yeah, yes, for Christmas celebration. It's not very not anything <laughs> else. Y'all know me. Uh, but, <laughs> The bar is pretty low, uh, but no, I just didn't want you. I was like, that's gotta be about Christmas, right? <laughs> yeah. So that's what I've been doing. But other than that, just getting ready for the holidays. Oh, I was going to say my, uh, I did my social media fast. Uh, if, anybody oh, yeah. was, if anybody was doing it with us, uh, congratulations. Uh, mine lasted four hours. So <laughs> And that's officially off the table now, right? That's for both of us. I mean, I'm not really posting, but I'm scrolling. Yeah. And, uh, but I did tell my therapist, you know, that and everything. And she sort of gave me a pass right now on, on the social media thing. So I was like, okay, I'm not going to feel bad about it just yet. So yeah, uh, maybe we can do that for like dry January. Yeah, or something. Maybe. <laughs> dry January. <laughs> It'll be a social media dry. <laughs> Gosh, that's hilarious. So we should get on with the ed- uh, with the interview because Greta has a lot of great things to say. Yes. All right. Here we go. So here's Greta. Well, today we're super excited to talk to Greta Boris. Hi, Greta. How are you? Great. I'm so excited to be on the show. Well, we're excited to have you. Well, let me read your bio and we'll get right into the questions. Greta Boris is the USA Today bestselling author of The Seven Deadly Sins Murders, a psychological suspense series. In the Mortician Murders, a Paranormal Cozy series. She's also the co-founder of The Author Wheel, a company that provides books, courses, and a podcast for writers. The podcast is, design- is designed to help authors save time and money and keep their stories rolling. Greta hails from sunny Southern California, where, based on her stories, which are all set there, things are darker than you'd expect. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. I love that. Yeah, love it. <laughs> love it. That's perfect. <laughs> Eva, I like to kill people, so that is definitely darker than you'd expect. So <laughs> I love that. I like to kill people, uh, yeah. but only, only in the fiction, pages. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yes. Greta, tell us how you got into writing. Well, you know, probably like a lot of the people you interview, um, I was born into a very like writing, reading kind of family. My dad was a. a editor and publisher of magazines and my mother was a musician and a voice teacher and we lived in New York and she taught voice to actors a lot of actors who'd get a Broadway part and had to sing so Mm -hmm. I was immersed in story and I was a voracious reader and um, I just always knew I would do something with story originally I thought it would be acting until I realized, oh no, <laughs> that would be a really rotten world. You get rejected <laughs> all day long, even worse than authors. Yeah, that wasn't happening. Um, but so that was my early, and then my first jobs were in magazines. You know, daddy got me a job mm-hmm. and I, I worked in magazines. And then I took a very long baby break. Uh, and when I got back to work, I was doing fitness and I just wrote, Uh, Somebody told me about this crazy thing called indie publishing. Um, And I wrote my first nonfiction book, which I independently published. And that was back in the, trying to remember what year it was, but I think it was kind of in the gold rush days Mm. because Mm. that book, it was called the wine and chocolate workout. And it, um, I'm in on that. Uh, mm-hmm. It's what everybody <laughs> said. It was a better title than it was a book. But it did get, <laughs> let's have the battle. The top, it's getting a good title, though. It, oh, really? It hit the top 10 in Kindle. It was right up to the wheat, next to the wheat belly diet for like a week. Oh, wow. And uh, I know. But um, then, so I got bit by the writing bug and I started writing for the health, wellness, and beauty industry in magazines and. Um, I was the editor of an online magazine for a while. Uh, But I always kind of thought that fiction was for special people, Mm. like elite people. You know, I thought you meant people. No, (laughs) that kind of special. No. Well, we are that kind of special for sure. Right. We are. We're not. (laughs) We're not like normal people. Yeah. Whatever normal is. But, uh, but yes. I wasn't sure I was like one of you guys at that mm-hmm. time. I feel like now I fully embraced my specialness, but uh, <laughs> I, 
anyway, so I interviewed two fiction authors for a magazine. One of them was a dear friend of mine, Deanna Cameron, who it writes under D.D. LaCroix. LaCroix? LaCroix. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and then the other was Joanna Penn, mm. and which most of us have heard of. Yeah. And uh, I thought, oh, maybe I could write fiction. Like, mm-hmm. so I started and I wrote my first horrible, terrible, no good, very bad novel. And (laughs) that was the beginning of it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. And so you've gone on from that to be uh, published published by a small small press. Would that be how you describe it? Yeah. And then indie publishing. Indie Mm -hmm. publishing after that with with your with a a different series, right? Correct. Yeah. Uh, So I did get a. a two book contract. So I, my first series is the seven deadly sins. Mm-hmm. So I got a two book contract with the first right of refusal for the other mm-hmm. five. Cause you can't mm-hmm. really have two deadly sins. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah. And that first novel got published in 2017. And I, I just rewrote it actually for the publisher um, this last year it, mm-hmm. um, because, you know, first novels it wasn't great and it was the gateway drug into the rest of the sins so Mm -hmm. we thought we'd give it up Mm -hmm. so I did that and at the same time I've been working on independently publishing my own series which is the mortician mysteries mortician murders sorry okay all right well we will get into that more as it goes along but just kind of wanted to give an overview of like kind of your career progression Mm -hmm. because it's interesting Mm -hmm. I don't know that a lot of people have moved from nonfiction to small press boutique publishing to indie publishing. So that'll be interesting. Yeah. 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 Well, so what is your definition of success? Yeah, this is a, this question took me a really long time thinking about this. (laughs) (laughs) Oh gosh. But I would say it's just a moving target, right? Mm -hmm. So in in Mm -hmm. the beginning, it was getting a contract. That was, Mm -hmm. that was it, you know? And very quickly, it moved toward a financial goal because, Mm -hmm. you know, I realized that, um, that, uh, well, anyway, it just wasn't happening right Mm -hmm. there with a Mm -hmm. small, uh, with a small press. So I'd say right now, what it is for me is to have a scalable publishing and teaching business and author helps business Mm -hmm. um, that I have some control over. Mm. And equally important to me is that I can, um, you know, touch readers or students' hearts and minds and have an impact, you know, positive impact that something, give them something that sticks with them, something they can chew on and something right. that's very helpful for them. That's, that's my, that's success for me. Oh, I love that. And that you can control. I love that part. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, um, what do you wish you'd known about writing and craft when you started writing fiction? Well, you know, coming from nonfiction, mm-hmm. I, I just thought because I could turn a phrase and because I had a, a good vocabulary that this whole story thing was just going to be like a piece of cake. It's like, no, it's the difference like between running a, a 5K and an ultra marathon. You know, and fiction is just so much more difficult. And I was such a a reader and I knew what I liked, Mm -hmm. but I couldn't replicate it. You know, I guess like, I I love a book like this, but for the life of me trying to figure out how to write it, I knew nothing about tension. I knew nothing about um, pacing. So Mm -hmm. just as a funny little, my very first terrible book that nobody will ever read um, basically it was this woman who was going through a midlife crisis, a lot like mine, walking through a neighborhood, a lot like mine with her dog, a lot like mine and nothing <laughs> happened for three quarters of the book. And then all of a sudden I realized, oh, nothing's happening. So she bumps into a serial killer. <laughs> so that was the book. It was bad. <laughs> So story structure, obviously, I needed to learn story structure, pacing, tension, pretty much everything. Yeah. And so how did you do that? How did you kind of learn about the elements of story? 
Well, some really great books and some courses I, I took. Uh, I took Margie Lawson's, got mm-hmm. some really great yeah. book, uh, great courses. So I took her courses. Um, then I also, uh, Alessandra, no, not Alessandra Torrey. Uh, um, what is her name? I'm trying to remember. But there was a great book on story structure for uh, written by a screen. She was originally a screenplay writer. And then she, I'm trying to think of her name, but anyway, that book was super helpful. Um, Mm -hmm. I joined critique groups and went to conferences. I just, I just, you know, Vulcan mind melded with anybody Mm -hmm. who knew how to do it, who was willing to Vulcan mind meld with me, you Mm -hmm. know, just admit and wrote a lot, a lot, a lot of crappy stuff that never was going to get published, you know? Yeah. I think that's part of it is just getting in there and just trying it and taking all taking it all in and then figuring out practice 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 so yeah yeah very true. absolutely absolutely yeah. yeah well what about marketing what do you wish you'd known about marketing well that you, you know getting a publisher doesn't automatically put you on the happy boat to you know <laughs> fame and fortune land you know yeah. that just that is not <laughs> I thought that. I mean, I just thought, oh, you get the contract and boom, boom, you know, baby, move over. I'm buying a beach house. But it didn't happen. You're having dinner with uh, Nora and James Patterson. Um, Oh, absolutely. And, you know, me and Stephen King are best buds. Um, (laughs) But yeah, that didn't happen. So um, I had a, a big aha moment, I think, after my second seven deadly sin was published in two like a thump thump like mm-hmm. crickets mm-hmm. and uh so I, I realized well i can't i can't do advertising you know doesn't the roi isn't there when you're traditionally published but i could start building my mailing list and oh, that's a great that's, idea and, and and creating networks with other authors in mm-hmm. my genre and doing author cross promotions building my mailing list and I'm really grateful for that. So that when I did decide to just jump off into indie publishing um, this last year, I had a base, you know, Mm -hmm. I knew some other authors, they did cross promotions. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I had a mailing list, so it was not as scary as it would have been. Right. That's excellent. I think that's a, that's really good advice just to focus on maybe those two things, just mail the mailing list and then, you know, get connected with some other authors in the in the genre you were writing, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. So other mystery thriller writers. And mm-hmm. and honestly, I did kind of build a network with indie authors because traditionally published authors, in my experience, traditionally published authors, by and large, are not uh, as willing to do cross promotion. I did get Mm -hmm. some author blurbs, really nice Mm -hmm. blurbs from some, you know, Mm -hmm. traditionally published authors, but not, they don't do a lot of, so a lot of them don't even have newsletters. I know Um, it's a very different game. Yeah. Yeah. It's a completely different world. So, you know, I found interesting, I read The Hating Game by Sally Thorne, and I loved it so much. Like, I adored that book that I immediately went to the back of the book to try to find her email or her, you know, her website or whatever. And do you know that, like, I could not find a way in the world to contact her except through the publisher. And yeah. I just was like, that is so sad. This woman probably really would like to hear from readers. But yeah, it was it was unfortunate. It's funny too. So sometimes if you follow some of the like I Tess Garrett's and I, mm-hmm. I followed her on Twitter and I commented about something and she commented right back at me on Twitter. So I think sometimes the bigger named authors, they they're not opposed. It's just the way the system is set up. I right. know. Yeah. It's very yeah. protective. Yeah. And it's like the, the way it's more old school, you know, it's set up that everything goes through the publisher and, and if authors do have their own mailing list and stuff, it's, um, it's great. And they can use that. They can leverage that for themselves, but um, it's not, I don't remember it being very like encouraged or anything like that when I was traditionally published. So. Yeah. yeah. 
it's a real it's not, missed opportunity, I think. Oh, I, I definitely think for authors and um, it's difficult, I think, for some traditionally published authors to transition into indie be, if they haven't thought this out or, or met other indie authors and learned mm-hmm. some business stuff from them because you're just like walking into a void. Mm-hmm. It's, it's two, like two, two different complete, worlds. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that was a, a, a real um, mindset shift for me as I went to Bowser Khan. Mm-hmm. And um, Can you I explain was, what that is, real quick. Oh yeah, sure. For so BoucherCon is is a big mystery thriller uh, conference for mm-hmm. primarily traditionally published authors. There's not much indie stuff going on there. And I had I just written my first mortician book, and I wanted to pitch it to agents and bigger publishers there. Mm-hmm. And I I just saw a different. I just. I'd been to conferences before, but for some reason it just hit me. It's like, I felt like I was trying to get into the really big in crowd group at mm-hmm. high school, you know? Mm-hmm. And I just thought, I, I don't like this. <laughs> I yeah. don't want yeah. to do this. And I yeah. mean, I, I, I met some, like, I, I had wine with Heather Graham and mm-hmm. Tony Hillerman's daughter, Anne and I had dinner together and they were so sweet and lovely people. And I thought, I, I don't see myself ever Mm-mm. getting there, you know, Mm-mm. I mean, Mm-mm. and so, um, yeah, I had, um, I came home, I was very shook up mm-hmm. and then I had a dream. Ah, <laughs> and, the uh, dream. dream. <laughs> and in this dream, I was on a train and George Burns was with me on, I don't know why. <laughs> George Burns is like on the, the best train. story. <laughs> and he's oh. my agent. Oh, and he's my agent. Oh, We're wow. on this train. I know. And at one point, this is the most I remember of the dream. He pulls his cigar out of his mouth and he goes, so do you want to sell books or you want to be important? <laughs> and I woke up <laughs> and I went, oh, duh, I want to sell books. Mm-hmm. And it, I think that was the shift for me. It was yeah. like this, yeah. you know, I mean, to stop seeking just being important and mm-hmm. start seeking doing you know, making some income for my family and, Mm -hmm. and writing books that I want to love, uh, that I love and that I hope readers love that Mm -hmm. might not be very important books. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I think that's so great. I I think it's, you know, we all sort of have to come to that place too. Mm -hmm. Do you need, do you want validation or do you want to sell books and, you know, and, or have some control over selling books Mm -hmm. is the better thing because yeah. there's no guarantee if you indie publish you're going to sell books but you know no. you have better. yeah with indie publishing the ball is definitely in your court and you yes. can control right. a lot more and make yes. a lot more things happen yes exactly right. exactly and well I, oh go ahead sir oh, i was just gonna say and of course my business partner is indie megan yes. haskell with the yes. author wheel so she's like a little voice in my ear for the oh, yeah. past number of years too so and she's <laughs> super 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 smart and uh oh, yeah. a real go-getter so yeah i'm sure it's that it's more than a little voice it's probably a bigger voice <laughs> yeah <laughs> really persuasive because she's also persuasive <laughs> yeah yes <laughs> so, um, what assumptions uh, did you make at the beginning of your writing career and looking back, did they turn out to be right or wrong? I know you said you thought, you know, you'd be hanging out with, with the big, the big guys, uh, <laughs> Yeah, but anything else? Uh, I, I, I think it just that it is, it's, n- it's not just about writing the books. Uh, yes. That's super important. And I, I do not regret you know, having a traditional deal because I think it pushed me, um, you know, in the craft process, but it's a lot, a lot about marketing and understanding what, what readers are looking for, readers of your genre are looking for and delivering that. And that is, I didn't get that at all in the beginning. Right. You know, Right. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I talked about it last week on the podcast, but um, Melanie Harlow's talk at Nink and at um, 20 books was don't give them spaghetti if they want cake, which is <laughs> if they want cake, give them cake. That's why they're coming to you for cake. Though you might make a great spaghetti, they want the cake. So give them what they want. Yeah. So, yeah. Really yeah. yeah. That's a good 
phrase. Yeah. Very memorable, memorable too. Mm -hmm. So have you ever made a mistake that turned out to be a good thing? Well, um, I would say that in a way it could be looked at that traditional publishing with a small press was a mistake and financially it wasn't a great thing, but it really was a good thing for me because um, like my first editor for the first three, four books, she was, she had been a division editor at Harlequin and she was a college professor and she was tough. Oh my gosh. It was <laughs> just like, every time I get edits back from her, I'd have to prepare myself. I'd cry for 24 hours. Like, <laughs> But it was so good for me because I mean, she taught me so much. It was like going through college. So I do think that that did it did. It, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be, and it wasn't what I had hoped it was going to be. But it was good for me, you know. It yeah, was sounds like it helped you like really level up your writing skills. It sounds like. Oh, yeah. It was a slap upside the head every time, <laughs> in, in a would, loving, good way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I had that too. Only not from an editor, <laughs> from a critiquer. Yeah. Uh, what about the opposite? Have you ever had an idea and you thought this is a home run and then it turned out not to be so great? Well, yeah. Writing a series based on the seven deadly sins. I would not recommend that to anybody. <laughs> for, for one thing, it's like it, it, it shoves you into a thematic mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. For another thing, if you publish the first book with lust in the title, which the first book was called The Margin of Lust, the new version will be called The Liability of Lust. Everybody thinks that it's a steamy romance, you know, kind oh, of thing. Yeah, yeah. And I always said it's called Lust because my main character wasn't getting any. It was clean. <laughs> I, I, a lot of murders, but <laughs> clean. <laughs> so, um, and I, I, um, so that was difficult. And then Sloth, uh, try to write a book about people who don't do anything. That's really interesting too. So, I mean, yeah, I just thought it was so darn clever. And if I, I, I it was a lot of work and it's done and I think they're good books, mm -hmm. but um, I would not do that again. <laughs> That's really interesting because I, I would think even for a murder mystery, like, or, you know, that would be a great thing, but I do think you, you make a good point. You got to think it all the way through, you know, yeah. and I don't tend to do that. I think about book one <laughs> and then I'm like, I'll make it work down the road. And you really <laughs> need to think it all the way through. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. That was, it was a, it was a big challenge. A lot yeah. of pencil chewing. Yeah. And then, like you said before, it's the seven deadly sins. So readers are expecting seven books, right? Or they were right. looking for them. So you're kind of locked in already to doing seven instead of maybe just a couple. <laughs> so. Right. And deciding, is this series going to take off? Is this going to yeah. do very well? Or is it not going to do very well? Um, you know, you kind of had to go for it. <laughs> yeah. Just do it. Yeah. So. yeah. yeah. Well, you talked a little bit earlier earlier, you talked a little bit about, um, mindset changes you've had to make, um, is like, what do you think are the biggest things you've had to like change the way you think about? Well, I, I mean, emotionally, the biggest thing was what I said, like, what, what are you doing this for? Are you doing this because you want people to think you're important or are you doing this, which they didn't. So it wasn't working anyway. <laughs> um, and, um, or do you want to like contribute to the family coffers, you know, I want to get some money in. And so that was big. And then once I made that decision, um, mindset change is like, okay, then this is a business. Mm -hmm. And let's think about this as a business. I mean, yes, it's creative and artistic and that part is lovely, but, um, you know, it's also a business and you, huh. you know, you have to learn advertising and marketing and mm -hmm. all the things mm -hmm. and there's a lot of things to learn yeah but the way so, you've done it it's like you kind of tackled the craft first yeah and yeah. then like now you've kind of eased into more of the business aspects so yeah that's worked out well it sounds like yes and and actually you know like even publishing I'm I, I know you're wide 
Sarah, mm-hmm. and I know you're in KU, Jamie. Yeah. And I just decided I'm going to KU first. I'm, I'm my traditionally published books are wide and I may go wide eventually. I probably will, but I'm just baby stepping into it, mm-hmm. you know, because mm-hmm. it's a lot to learn and right. I would rather oh, do things correctly um, from the get-go than mm-hmm. try to stretch myself too thin. But then, you know, we also have the nonfiction. I also have the nonfiction side of the world and those books, um, Megan and I have been independently publishing, um, and they are wide and, but <laughs> Megan does most of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, it's been it's a great easy. system then. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really good system. It's, just, it's like me. Give it to Megan. I, I have a podcast wife. You have a <laughs> podcast. Sounds like you have a podcast wife or and or business wife. So yeah. Yes, I, I, absolutely. <laughs> so. Well, let's talk about the author wheel and um, what it is, what it encompasses. So let's start with how did you and Megan connect, first of all? Well, we met at a writer's conference uh-huh. and um, we just kind of hit it off. We were both there with our very first books and mm-hmm. I was pitching my first seven Dilly Sin and she um, had already decided she wanted to independently publish, but she wanted to put her book in front of editors and agents just to see, you know, mm-hmm. what they mm-hmm. thought about it. Mm-hmm. Cause she's smart like that. See, <laughs> I wouldn't have thought of that. Mm-hmm. She's just smart. <laughs> um, but we really hit it off. And then um, we were both part of a, a writer, big writing community called o- OC writers for orange County writers. Mm-hmm. And the woman who ran that Deanna Cameron wanted to give it to me. She was burnt out. And I said, well, I won't do it unless I have a partner. And so I thought about Megan and so we did that together. We ran, we were the directors of OC writers for a few years. And then about a year before, and we started teaching then, and we started teaching at conferences. Our first courses that we taught and our first things were, do you want to go trad or do you want to go self-publishing? Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, we were Lucy and Ethel on that. And I did the <laughs> one and she did the other. And, you know, it was kind of cute. And um uh, and we have, that was our first book that we wrote together too. And uh, so, and then we just kind of morphed on from there. And then, but right before COVID, thankfully, we decided to pull out of that and move things online because we'd oh. done mostly in-person teaching at conferences and things. And we decided to start putting courses on online and, mm-hmm. you know, all of that. So yeah was a good decision right before yeah. COVID. Perfect so, timing. Yeah. 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 Well, so tell us a little bit about like what you do now with the author wheel. So you have a podcast and we do books, right? Yes, we do. So the podcast is only one season so far, but it's going well. And, you know, Sarah, your episode <laughs> has been the big hit the, oh, has had the most downloads of wow, yay. <laughs> I, know, I know and then um we we just recorded our wrap-up season one wrap-up uh-huh. uh yesterday and we talked about you jamie we said oh. jamie's gonna be on the podcast next year but she doesn't know it <laughs> 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 we talked about you uh, and good. um so that's going, so that's really fun. We're really enjoying that. And then we also, the author wheel started as a, um, well, we, we have some books. We've just, this last year, we published our first three quick guides. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have the quick guide to uh, productive writing habits, the quick guide to planning a novel, the quick guide to understanding your genre. And then we're, um, our goal is to make courses for each of the books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're actually going to, we also interviewed Russell Nolte Mm -hmm. on the podcast and we're going to do a Kickstarter next year. You've been an inspiration, Sarah. Oh, good. I'm so glad. I think you guys will do great. Yeah. Nonfiction seems to do so well on Kickstarter. So it really does. It does. Yeah. Well, I love that, um, your quick starter to understanding genre. Cause I just think that I, I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that authors, ma- new authors make. Is yeah. That, well, even some more seasoned authors <laughs> yeah, um, make just not understanding their genre and what is expected and what the readers expect, what they will forgive, what they won't forgive kind of mm. thing. And I think, um, I think that's awesome for anybody that's just starting or hasn't been able to find traction so far. 
something like that would be just great for um, a newer author. You know, when I was pitching um, my first book around and I was getting, you know, all the agent rejections mm-hmm. and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I had one um, editor from a, a publishing company tell me, I don't know what this book is. This book, uh, it, it, yeah. it reads kind of literary, but then it, it's kind of like a thriller, but then it also feels like a romance. So what the heck <laughs> are you doing? Yeah. yeah. And that's when I started studying on genre and mm-hmm. uh, I did do a lot of go to the library, put all the books out, evaluate them. And we actually have a little tool in that understanding your genre book for how to Mm -hmm. go in and evaluate what's selling in your chosen genre. So that's great. That's great. Yeah. I think that's awesome. Tell us a little bit about your collaboration process with you and Megan. How do y'all write Mm -hmm. the books Mm -hmm. together, the courses? Do y'all have, does it work the same way with each one or is it different with each, each book or course? Well, the first book that we wrote, which is called Publish, Take Charge of Your Author Career, and that's the one, that's our longest book, and it's Mm -hmm. about publishing. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of easy because I wrote the parts about traditional publishing and how do you Mm -hmm. get an agent and all of that kind of stuff. And she wrote Mm -hmm. the parts about indie publishing and and that. But then the quick guides, what we've kind of done is we blogged on the topics first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then because she does a lot of the techie stuff that I don't do as much of, I made myself the editor. And so then I would take those blog posts and weave them together. And then if we were missing or we had a hole or we needed more, it was like, okay, let's blog on this topic. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And that until we had it uh, really. So I guess I would say I did most of the writing, actual writing on those books in terms of the what's in the book, but mm-hmm. I would take a lot of Megan's blog posts on different topics. And, Mm -hmm. um, but we kind of would sit down every few months and say, okay, what should we write about? This is before we started the podcast and we were mostly Mm -hmm. blogging. And what should Mm -hmm. we talk about this next quarter? And then we'd kind of do what, whoever knew the most or had Mm -hmm. the most interesting ideas. And, and if it was a topic that neither one of us wanted to talk about, we flipped a coin. (laughs) because sometimes those topics just need to be covered and they're like nobody's really that excited yeah nobody's excited they need to be talked about but nobody wants to do it yeah exactly Exactly. so that's great and so did how did the podcast come about just because you wanted to like sarah and i you know we've always said this podcast is unprofessional sometimes as it is as it is like today um for me anyway, um, is a love letter to, to the indie Authors publishing and indie world publishing, yeah, yeah. because we just love podcasting. We love podcasts so much and got so much from it. Is it, is yours strategic for the nonfiction or was it just, we want, it's just another medium to get things out there or what just, or all of the above. I'm just curious. I think it's kind of all of the above. I think we, I love podcasts. I listen to more podcasts than, and I love your guys' podcast. I have not missed one episode. This is a bucket lister for me. Honestly, (laughs) I am am such, Sarah knows when she came on our podcast, I like fangirled all over. I'm controlling myself with you, Jamie. Um, (laughs) Controlling myself. (laughs) Really. I just love you. Um, But I, you know, I just, I love the podcast just make you feel connected, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. to the community. Mm-hmm. And I think so like networking, feeling connected to the community. Mm-hmm. Um, also when we first started teaching it, it, in the first conferences and places we taught, we didn't even charge anything. It was giving yeah. back. It's mm-hmm. like, these are the things we've learned where we're relatively new in the mm-hmm. publishing business. So we weren't that many steps ahead of mm-hmm. some of these right. people who knew nothing. Mm-hmm. So we remembered, oh, you know. Mm-hmm. So we like to say that what we do is we kind of curate because mm-hmm. there's so much information out there right. and there's yeah. so many scammy people who are trying to mm-hmm. take advantage of authors. Yeah. And I know people yeah. who've just been so just, scammed Mm -hmm. um that we for our podcast slightly different than your guys um we are primarily in when well we have duo episodes it's just the two of us talking Mm -hmm. about different topics but uh, which are a little more strategic toward our 
nonfiction stuff. But um, when we interview people, we try to interview people who have a, a product or service for writers that we trust, that we think, oh, this is a good product. This is a good service. Mm-hmm. We would send people to this person mm-hmm. um, to help people to kind of navigate through all that. You know? Yeah. And I love that because you're right. I mean, there's, there are just some charlatans taking people's money. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I think it's great service really in protecting the community. So that's awesome. And you're doing it in a positive way. You're not going on going, here's a list of people to stay away from. <laughs> oh, no. I feel We're just like saying- that might not go over as well. And <laughs> yeah, um, I'd agree. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I think it's great. And I also think it's great strategically for your nonfiction stuff. And this is why, because, you know, you, you have this thing because I've done it where you listen to a podcast and you think, you know, the people like you listen Mm -hmm. to them every week. I mean, Sarah and I, I don't know Mm -hmm. if she had the experience, but I had the experience when we first met Joanna Penn because Mm -hmm. we met her at the same time. And it was just like, I've known Joanna forever. Mm -hmm. And she's like, yeah. Who is this woman with this horrible accent? And um, why does she keep asking why, me to copy? Yeah. Why does she keep following me everywhere I go? Um, because we're so, old friends. Yeah. Didn't you know that? I felt like we were. But we've experienced it on the other side, too, where we've gone to conferences and people have come up. I love it. I love when people come up and it's like they feel like they know me because that's how I want them to feel. I've mm-hmm. Clearly, I hold very little back. And so, um, (laughs) so I just, I think that that's great though. If you're, if you're trying to build trust and, uh, um, reliability and just a Mm -hmm. a reputation with your audience that you're going to give things to or sell things to at some point. And so I just think that's awesome. I think it's really smart. Well, thank you. It, Mm -hmm. it's a lot of fun. And honestly, uh, we were talking about this in the wrap up episode yesterday that one of, I am a pretty gregarious person. I mean, Megan considers herself an introvert. I do not consider myself an introvert. Mm-hmm. Nobody else does either. Yeah. So um, I <laughs> just can only be alone with my pretend friends, my mm-hmm. fictional <laughs> friends for right. so long before right. I have to talk to real people or I just mm-hmm. get weird. I mean, yeah, I'm yeah. probably weird anyway, but weirder. How about no, that? No, I, I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. I mean, yeah. honestly, this podcast saved my sanity in 2020. I, I think mean, mine too. I, yeah. No doubt. Oh, I think- 100%. Just I think you guys sanity. saved my sanity mm. in 2020. <laughs> I told Sarah, I like, I found your guys' podcast and I was like, oh my gosh, it's like sitting in a coffee shop with my friends. Oh, that's nice. That's and nice because we wanted it to be that way. So it's nice to know we achieved that on some level. So that's great. But yeah, yeah I mean, I just, I love it. I think that there aren't, I mean, I know there are a ton of podcasts, but I always encourage people, if you're thinking about doing a podcast, do it. I mean, you may get into it and find you don't want to do it every week. I mean, Sarah and I, we're on here almost every week, except mm-hmm. for the summer, you know, when we took a little bit of time off. But, um, and some people don't want to do that. But if you've got something to say, or you've got another angle or way mm-hmm. to say it, because not everybody relates to me right yeah and people Sarah, are gonna, you know yeah, yeah people I mean, are going to resonate with different mm-hmm. personalities yeah, so I think absolutely. it's good that there's a lot of different absolutely. writing podcasts mm-hmm. so yeah yeah that did too. That did too. and different ones cover different aspects mm-hmm. and yeah. are good for different time frames in your mm-hmm. life and right, right. exactly in, in your writing life and your writing career like I think we kind of really focus on newer writers and or people like me who are mm-hmm. transitioning mm-hmm. from indie I mean from Traditional, traditional to indie. Into indie. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. kind of our major our audience. Special Not that, area, yeah. I mean, like some more experienced authors, you know, hopefully they would get something out of it too, or just right. like to listen to me and make it. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. I so, well, actually prefer podcasts that have two hosts. I I noticed that's what I pick to listen to because I mm-hmm. like the interaction between the mm-hmm. two people and mm-hmm. they seem to last longer than the solo host they seem to yeah. have the longevity you know? yeah 
I think so. probably because you're not carrying the load by yourself. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. If I was, this would have lasted about three episodes uh, if I was doing it. By- <laughs> I don't even think I could have figured out how to upload it to Buzzsprout. So <laughs> that would have been, yeah. Yeah. Well, I wanted to ask real quickly about like um, community. Like we talked a little bit about how, like as a podcast, you develop kind of a following or a community. Are y'all doing anything specifically to? Uh, develop community? Are you doing like a Patreon or a Facebook group or anything like that? Well, we have a Facebook page, but neither one of us are sterling uh, (laughs) social media people. (laughs) You take after my Facebook philosophy of just like, (laughs) (laughs) oh, once in a while, I told her we have to put up dog pictures, dogs with Christmas hats pretty soon. So that's kind of like where we're going but um, <laughs> that's my big idea, I think so, so big idea. but um uh, uh so what we we will eventually i mean we have teachable we have courses on teachable we have taught we still teach locally or we've been doing more zoom stuff we've been mm-hmm. we teaching for the new room you know all the groups that dropped out of romance writers of America, but have started new romance groups. We've done some teaching there and yeah, um, that kind of thing, but mostly on zoom and then um, networking this networking with other podcasters. I mean, like you, you guys yeah. having me on is just an incredibly wonderful gift mm-hmm. and I really appreciate it. And the willingness of this community to, um, to share is just really lovely and, and, so we're kind of doing that. And then, of course, we're doing Kickstarter, like I said. Yeah. And that'll be a good community builder. That's going to be fun. Yeah, it'll be yeah. a great community builder. Well, our last yeah. question is usually, what do you do to set, what have you done to set yourself up for success? Which I'm going to let Sarah answer. I mean, ask, not answer. <laughs> Why would I let her answer? <laughs> she can answer for me. Shoot, y'all. <laughs> anyway, so let Sarah ask that because I want to ask, What's the best thing someone coming from the traditional world into the indie world can do to set themselves up for success or at least prepare them? What do you think that would be? I kind of threw that at you from left field. No, that's actually easier for me than the other question. (laughs) So (laughs) I think that it would be number one, listen to podcasts. I know, I know I sound like I'm tooting my own horn because we just started (laughs) one, but no, really like Joanna Penn's podcast. Brilliant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so, so helpful. Your guys podcast is brilliant. There's just so many. I love uh, Brian Cohen and um, Claire, 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 Claire Claire Taylor's podcast. So, so many of those podcasts are so helpful. Um, that and then um, getting into organizations where you're going to meet indie authors because mm-hmm. you need to start meeting them, picking their brains, finding out what works and what doesn't work, mm-hmm. and making friends with them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, I'd say a mailing list. I because I have a smaller publisher, I did ask them. I said, "Can I write, um, you know, a reader magnet in my world?" Because technically, mm-hmm. my publisher owns the Seven Deadly Sins world. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was great. She said, "Yeah, mm-hmm. write it. We'll, you know, we'll edit it. We'll give it a cover. We'll do it all." And um, I put it up on Book Funnel and started doing cross promotions with that. And every once in a while, she'd let me give away like one of the seven deadly sins too, or mm-hmm. do a sale or when it was on a free mm-hmm. sale or a wow. 99 cent sale, mm-hmm. then I would quickly hit up all my traditionally, or I mean my indie author friends. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I would say that just trying to create an, an, uh, a group of indie authors in your genre that you right. can cross promote with and build a mailing list. Mm-hmm. That and I love Book Funnel for that, and I think uh, Book Sweeps can be great for that when you're in the beginning and you're just trying to get your first, yeah, your first piece get started. Yeah, mm-hmm. okay, yeah. Okay. I think that's so smart to just ask mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. you know, like, ask your publisher, can I do a prequel in this world? And mm-hmm. I mean, they may say no, but if they say yes, then you're set up to right. promote that in a new way that mm-hmm. you might, wouldn't have been able to before. So I think that's great. And in that. Go ahead. If, Go ahead. If they had said no, I would have written something else and given yeah. it away. Yeah. 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 But I think that is really good. And I think 
not, having never been traditionally published, so I could be talking out my butt here, but I don't think I am <laughs> in that asking your publisher and then explaining, this is why I want to do this. Like this will help you and help me. Like this mm-hmm. is a yeah. mutually beneficial sort of arrangement that if you let me write in this world or, or we can put a book on sale or whatever, the benefit from this, especially if you have a long series like yours, you got seven books. If you put one on sale or then you've got read through to the other books or whatever. So uh, yeah. I think that's, that's great. And, and educating traditional publishers, beca- publishers, because I don't know that they've all caught up. Some of them have, but I don't think they've all caught up to really just the easiest, most basic things about marketing, which, yeah. Yeah. It's smaller boutique publishers are tend to be more savvy, savvy. Mm -hmm. They're a little Mm -hmm. more like indie publishers and more willing to work with you and um, more willing to try new things. Yeah, exactly. We actually interviewed my publisher on the podcast because Mm -hmm. I know some people do want that traditional deal. Mm -hmm. And I would heart, she's very, very honest and Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thoughtful. And you know what I mean? She's, she's still a good friend, even though I'm writing indie. Yeah. And I would like to say to all of our listeners who are traditionally published, if you or want to be, you're not validation seeking. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I just, for me personally, I had to make the decision. Do I want to be validated or do I want to try to sell books? And for me, it came down to the last thing. It, your motivation may be something different and that val- validation may be super important to you and go for it. Live your life. Do you, you know, Live yeah, your best all, life on that one. It's so. all an individual. It comes down it to absolutely the individual. Is. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, and origin in the very beginning, I am very thankful that for that deal because I just know my personality and mm-hmm. I'm a little bit of a perfectionist and I wouldn't have had the courage. I mean, I, I threw up that wine and chocolate workbook workout uh, book and it did okay. And then I panicked and I stopped marketing it because I got one bad review. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I can't even write another book, you know? <laughs> so I needed handholding and I yeah, got handholding. Right. Yeah. I'm that's very great. grateful for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm okay. so glad we've got to talk to you about this because it's an interesting path that it not, mm-hmm. we don't talk about a whole lot. So it's mm-hmm. been really, really informative. So um, before we go, like what's the best thing you've done to set yourself up for success overall? Uh, so I guess what I would say is, um, probably the the years being devoted to the craft of writing a good book, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. that, that I feel pretty confident. I mean, you might not like my book or Joe down the street might not like my book, but I don't fall apart if somebody doesn't, Mm -hmm. because I just figure, well, it's a good book. It's just not the kind of book that they like. Like I, I understand the basics of craft. And even though mm-hmm. uh, I wished for overnight success, because mm-hmm. I didn't understand that didn't exist at mm-hmm. the time, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I'm really grateful I didn't have it, you know, mm-hmm. because that process that going to school of writing, 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 and, um, you know, that now when the books come out, I feel pretty confident. I get good reviews yeah. and yeah yeah that's i good. think that's awesome yeah. yeah love that answer love it well thank you mm-hmm. well it's been great having you it's nice to meet you and <laughs> uh we tell people where they can find out more about you and the author wheel and all of that so my website is gretaboris.com and my name is spelled with one t greta <laughs> And my last name is just like Boris Karloff. So <laughs> it's easier to remember with murder, Boris Karloff. And uh, GretaBoris.com is me. And I do have some freebies there. Um, and then the author wheel is the authorwheel.com. And um, the podcast is the author wheel. It's really com- very simple. <laughs> we'll, and we'll put the link in the show notes. Put the sure. link in the show notes. And yeah. we do have uh, our our little giveaway on the author will say it is the five, five common roadblocks new writers must overcome. Oh, that's so, great. Yeah. Right. So if anybody wants to check those out, come on yeah. over. To that's author worth wheel. the price of admission right there. Yeah. There you go. Very yeah. good. Very well, perfect. good. Perfect. 
All right. Well, we will have all those links in the show notes and you can find them at wish I'd known them podcast.com. And thanks to Alexa Larberg for editing and producing the podcast and to Adriel Wiggins for doing the admin. We'll see everybody next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the wish I'd known then podcast. We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you, and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. We look forward to being with you again next week.